During the early 1900s, over 9 million people left the hills and hollers of Appalachia in search of opportunity and a better life bound for the booming factory towns and cities of the industrial Midwest. Indeed, it was one of the largest migrations in American history as 9 million people left their farms in search of paying jobs. Yet, their story has rarely been told and chances are that many of you who are watching this from all across America right now and although you live in places like Michigan and Illinois or even California, you have a connection to Appalachia. Perhaps your grandfather once lived there and you're reconnecting with your roots. Or maybe you're still on the old homestead in West Virginia or North Carolina, holding tightly to the roots that your great-grandfather planted. Yet, you're one of the last of your family that remains. So, why did they leave? What caused millions to leave their beloved land for the unknown? Well, my friend, I'm glad you asked. And that's what this story is all about. There are few places more beautiful than the Appalachian Mountains. And for nearly 250 years, some of the most hardy men and women in America called this home. The log cabins, split rail fences, and grist mills built by these Scots-Irish, English, and Germans during the 17 and 1800s are now some of the most iconic and revered structures in America. For centuries, these people lived in the coves, in the hollers, and the fertile mountain valleys, living off of nature's rich bounty. Wildflowers filled their yards as grapevines ran down the eaves of their porch and smoke rose from their hand-built stone chimneys. It was a place of serene beauty, inhabited by rugged men and women who were just as tough as nails. They were bold and daring. Their ancestors had made the long journey to America, having fled persecution and countless wars on the other side of the world. They left behind the heavy taxes imposed by kings on everything from their land to their liquor. Yet they brought with them their culture and their beliefs, and they believed that the freedom to bear arms and sell whiskey were part of every man's birthright. Appalachia was their home, a roadless wilderness of crags and coves. The valleys were filled with farms, churches, and schools. And as their sons and daughters grew into adulthood, they built their new homes further up the creeks, but close to their family. For no good mountain man would let his family be scattered. Communities of kinfolks sprang up, and as the years went by, and each new generation succeeded the previous. Little cabins climbed further and further up the creeks where the soil was shallow and the bare bone of the mountain shone through. There were only a precious few steep sloping acres to farm that were walled in by a forest of chestnuts and oaks so tall that even the midday sun could barely wipe away the shadows. So you see, each new generation found life a little harder than the last. The few roads that existed, oh, they were little more than animal trails, used only by the folks who lived there. Yet, they gladly lived in splendid isolation within these rocky hollers. It was a rich land that gave them hillside family farms, cemeteries for their kin, and wood for their fiddles and dulcimers, and a sense of freedom that was quickly disappearing 
all throughout the flatland country beyond those mountains. Now, despite their isolation, the small communities grew. Men worked the farms and blacksmith shops, while women worked nearly everything. One woman once said, Men folk just want a woman that never sits down. They want one that'll work in the cornfield without getting tired and be so rested when the day is done that she'll make all the meals and tend to all the children and do all the chores while he eats and have a whole basket of youngins in her spare time. But these women love their hard-working men because I tell you, no mountain woman wanted a hen husband. Yes, sir, they were proud of their land. Up here is the only place to be, they would say, as they looked down with scorn at the bottom land, for down there the grass grew so thick that you couldn't even bust it with a hoe. Besides, the mountains provided everything you needed. A young man and his woman could start their life here with little more than a skillet and a hoe, and they would make their home where the trees were giant, and the sounds of the birds washed away all other sounds. With little more than a clear, cold mountain stream, they would start their lives by planting some corn in soil that was so loose you didn't even have to plow it. Now corn had many uses. It could be ground up for meal, used as a vegetable, or just as important, bottled up as moonshine. They grew oats, soybeans, and millet. They even grew grasses such as timothy, red top, and orchard. They grew cane to make sorghum molasses, and their vegetable gardens consisted of onions, Irish potatoes, peppers and turnips and peas and tomatoes, cabbages and strawberries. They planted apple, peach, and plum trees, while the forest provided a never-ending bounty of black walnuts, hickory nuts, blackberries, and huckleberries, and wild strawberries. Deer and wild turkey and rabbits and squirrels were abundant. Yet, the most important aspect of pioneer living in Appalachia was a chestnut tree with its straight, rot-resistant wood that was used in all their buildings, and more importantly, were the chestnuts that rained down from the canopies every fall. Every Appalachian, as well as every animal in the forest, depended on this tree for its bounty. Equipped with everything they needed to be self-sufficient, Appalachia and its people thrived for generations, building an authentic culture, a set of core values and work ethic, all while coexisting side by side with nature. So what happened? Hey guys, JD here. Click the link below to check out my new book. It's full of stories just like the one you're listening to right now. Now, back to the story. The war between the states brought change all across America, and Appalachia was no different. For the first time, northern industrialists made their way into this remote region, and when the war ended, they quickly began buying up enormous tracts of land and exploiting it of all its timber and its coal. For the first time, industry had invaded these mountains. Rich men north of Richmond began laying railroad tracks alongside mountain creeks, building towering bridges across ravines and dynamiting tunnels through mountains, creating a syringe that would allow industrialists to slowly extract the lifeblood of coal and timber out of Appalachia to build the rest of America. Like it or not, the outside world had come to this mountain utopia. For the first time, news from the outside world freely circulated the railroad brought a steady stream of foreigners who were willing to sell their souls, digging in the pitch black dungeons of the earth like moles, all for the chance to earn a dollar. Suddenly, the sounds of the wind rustling through the trees, along with the white noise of a mountain stream, were replaced with the sounds of trees crashing to the ground and the lonesome sound of lumber camp whistles, while the sounds of the birds and the animals were quieted 
by the non-stop sounds of locomotives carrying out hundreds of tons of coal every day. These new coal and lumber camps offered opportunity for any Appalachian man who was willing to leave his farm and move his family into the cookie-cutter coal shacks and work for company scrip, which he could use to buy all sorts of shiny, store-bought stuff that he had never seen before. Heck, he could buy his wife her first store-bought dress and his children their first store-bought shoes, but at what it cost. You see, once a man went to work for these companies, he soon found himself in debt to them for the items that he purchased on credit, thereby creating a vicious cycle of back-breaking labor and more debt. The companies, on the other hand, made a fortune, and some of the wealthiest families in the world today can track their accumulated wealth back to the exploitation of Appalachia's riches. Indeed, many folks viewed it as a tragedy each time a man from the community would leave his pioneer lifestyle behind and trade it in for selling what little time he had been blessed with on this earth for one of these new jobs down at the camps. Yet, Appalachia had always been a community that helped each other out. Each person had a role in these communities, whether he was a blacksmith, a farmer, a miller, a hunter-gatherer, or anything else. And each time a man left, the entire community suffered until nearly every man across the mountains went to work for these companies. The first decade of the 1900s brought with it World War I, and this brought massive changes in America's biggest cities, who were for the first time cut off from their cheap labor of migrant European countries. It was essential to keeping their factories going. Looking to continue paying low wages, these companies took a page out of the coal and timber industry's playbook and actively began recruiting Appalachian men to work in these northern factories. This was the first wave of men to leave Appalachia, yet it went unnoticed by most of America, who were instead focused on the northern migration of blacks from Mississippi and Alabama. Now, during the Great Depression, most folks in Appalachia didn't notice when it started or when it ended, since, for the most part, they were still isolated from the rest of America. Aside from the railroad and a few state highways, there were few roads that cut into the heart of the region. And by now, the chestnut tree fungus that had accidentally been imported from China to New York City was spreading across Appalachia like wildfire as the fungus killed every chestnut tree in Appalachia. This was devastating to the last families holding on to the pioneer lifestyle. Gong was a primary food source of all the animals of the forest, and 25% of all trees in Appalachia suddenly died, all four billion of them, never to return. On top of the unregulated logging industry, suddenly the mountains were stripped bare. The result? was that every man who had resisted America's capitalism system was suddenly forced to work. Another major event that drove the families out was the government seizure of over a half a million acres of property in Tennessee and North Carolina, creating the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Families had no choice but to leave, and many of them had nowhere to go. Companies like Ford and General Motors quickly capitalized on this, and they actively recruited these hillbillies to work in their factories for even lower wages, since ownership considered them too uneducated to strike or form unions. A steady stream of migration of families along U.S. Highway 23 from Tennessee, North Carolina, Kentucky, and West Virginia headed north bound for the factories of the Rust Belt. Meanwhile, men from Kentucky went to work in factories in Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio. Yet, once again, this massive migration from Appalachia wasn't even noticed due to the great droughts and the massive migration of the Dust Bowl in the American Midwest of the 1930s. World War 
War II saw men from Appalachia board warships where they returned across the same ocean that their ancestors had traveled across generations before. Back home, the demand for Appalachia's coal had never been higher, and the men had fought long and hard for increased wages and safety regulations. Coal was the absolute king of the economy, and every male living here knew that his sons would have the assurance of working as a miner as soon as they were old enough. However, the conclusion of the war resulted in a drastic reduction in the demand of coal. And furthermore, many of the men who fought in the war never returned home to Appalachia. Additionally, machinery began to replace jobs in the coal mines. And that post-war prosperity that was experienced all across America was noticeably absent from Appalachia as unemployment and poverty began to rise. The 1950s brought Interstate 75 and 81, which were the first superhighways to cut right through the heart of Appalachia. And for the next 20 years, the floodgates of families leaving the mountains were unstoppable. This new cruel, who the hell cares economics, had brutalized the Appalachian coal fields and set off a second great migration out of the mountains headed north for factory jobs in Chicago, Detroit, and Cleveland. And every weekend, pickup trucks crammed with mattresses, lampshades, and children could be seen winding out of the hollers and onto the wide asphalt interstate as family upon family was split apart as one of America's oldest and misunderstood cultures began to crumble. Thousands of houses began to be torn down, and many that remained sit abandoned among weeds and black-eyed Susans. And by the 1980s, much of Appalachia's coal had been extracted, and the industries just closed their doors and left entire communities to die. Suddenly, all the mining machinery was gone. All the concrete buildings were broken and full of holes with the corrugated aluminum peeling away where crows were now perched on top of the exposed steel girder bones. The few companies that remained adopted modern machinery that resulted in over 50% of the miners losing their jobs. These new long wall mining machines could each replace six men and produce twice as much coal Unemployment was now 25% in West Virginia and Kentucky. Yet, many of the factory jobs in the North began disappearing as the large companies, always looking for cheaper labor, began migrating to China and Mexico. So now, folks in Appalachia began migrating south to the textile mills and the furniture-making factories. In West Virginia alone, the entire state lost 10% of its population during the 1980s. All told, Appalachia's once virgin forests were decimated by the coal and timber companies. And during the years from 1910 to 1980, over 9 million people who had called these mountains home were forced to leave by the poverty that was left behind when these companies pulled out. The heartbreak of leaving seems unbearable. Almost nowhere else in America do people feel so interwoven with their culture and their land, from family graveyards to rounded mountains, casting shadows across forest, thick with poplars and sycamores and white oaks. One man said as he was leaving, I've roamed over every inch of these hills. Every time I walk my place, I see my grandpa and my grandma as they were when they were children. I see my whole family here, everywhere I walk. I'm walking in their footsteps. It's gonna be hard to leave because Appalachia is heaven, but there aren't any jobs. Mm -hmm.